John 17:17 17, 17 and 19 says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. 1 Peter 1, 22. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Philippians 2, 12 to 15. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. John 15:3. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Ephesians 5, 25-27 Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Here is Bible sanctification. It is not merely a show or outside work. It is sanctification received through the channel of truth. It is truth received in the heart and practically carried out in the life. Jesus, considered as a man, was perfect, yet he grew in grace, Luke 2.52, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Even the most perfect Christian may increase continually in the knowledge and love of God. Second Peter 3, 14 and 18 tells us, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Sanctification is not the work of a moment, an hour, or a day. It is a continual growth in grace. We know not one day how strong will be our conflict the next. Satan lives and is active. And every day we need to cry earnestly to God for help and strength to resist him. As long as Satan reigns, we shall have self to subdue, besetments to overcome. And there is no stopping place, there is no point to which we can come and say we have fully attained. Philippians 3.12 says, Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. The Christian life is constantly an onward march. Jesus sits as a refiner and purifier of his people, and when his image is perfectly reflected in them, they are perfect and holy and prepared for translation. A great work is required of the Christian, we are exhorted to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Here we see where the great labor rests. There is a constant work for the Christian. Every branch in the parent vine must derive life and strength from that vine in order to yield fruit. Chapter 5. The Power of Satan Fallen man is Satan's lawful captive. The mission of Christ was to rescue him from the power of his great adversary. 
Man is naturally inclined to follow Satan's suggestions, and he cannot successfully resist so terrible a foe unless Christ, the mighty conqueror, dwells in him, guiding his desires and giving him strength. God alone can limit the power of Satan. He is going to and fro in the earth and walking up and down in it. He is not off his watch for a single moment through fear of losing an opportunity to destroy souls. It is important that God's people understand this, that they may escape from his snares. Satan is preparing his deceptions that in his last campaign against the people of God they may not understand that it is he. Second Corinthians 11.14 says, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. While some deceived souls are advocating that he does not exist, he is taking them captive and is working through them to a great extent. Satan knows better than God's people the power that they can have over him when their strength is in Christ. When they humbly entreat the mighty conqueror for help, the weakest believer in the truth, relying firmly upon Christ, can successfully repulse Satan and all his host. He is too cunning to come openly, boldly, with his temptations, for then the drowsy energies of the Christian would arouse, and he would rely upon the strong and mighty Deliverer. But he comes in unperceived and works in disguise through the children of disobedience who profess godliness. Satan will go to the extent of his power to harass, tempt, and mislead God's people. He who dared to face and tempt and taunt our Lord, and who had power to take him in his arms and carry him to a pinnacle of the temple and up into an exceedingly high mountain, will exercise his power to a wonderful degree upon the present generation, who are far inferior in wisdom to their Lord, and who are almost wholly ignorant of Satan's subtlety and strength. In a marvelous manner will he affect the bodies of those who are naturally inclined to do his bidding. Satan exults that he is regarded as a fiction. When he is made light of and represented by some childish illustration or as some animal, it suits him well. He is thought so inferior that the minds of men are wholly unprepared for his wisely laid plans, and he almost always succeeds well. If his power and subtlety were understood, many would be prepared to successfully resist him. All should understand that Satan was once an exalted angel. His rebellion shut him out of heaven, but did not destroy his powers and make him a beast. Since his fall, he has turned his mighty strength against the government of heaven. He has been growing more artful and has learned the most successful manner in which to come to the children of men with his temptations. Satan has originated fables with which to deceive. He commenced in heaven to war against the foundation of God's government, and since his fall he has carried on his rebellion against the law of God and has brought the mass of professed Christians to trample under their feet the fourth commandment which brings to view the living God. He has torn down the original Sabbath of the Decalogue and substituted in its place one of the laboring days of the week. The great original lie which he told to Eve in Eden, Ye shall not surely die, was the first sermon ever preached on the immortality of the soul. That sermon was crowned with success and terrible results followed. He has brought minds to receive that sermon as truth, and ministers preach it, sing it, and pray it. No literal devil and probation after the coming of Christ are fast becoming popular fables. The scriptures plainly declare that every person's destiny is forever fixed at the coming of the Lord. Revelation 22, 11 and 12 says, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still, and he which is filthy, let him filthy still, 
And he that is righteous, let him righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Satan has taken advantage of these popular fables to hide himself. He comes to poor, deceived mortals through modern spiritualism, which places no bounds to the carnally-minded, and, if carried out, separates families, creates jealousy and hatred, and gives liberty to the most degrading propensities. The world knows but little, as yet, of the corrupting influence of spiritualism. The curtain was lifted, and much of its dreadful work was revealed to me. I was shown some who have had an experience in spiritualism and have since renounced it, who shudder as they reflect upon how near they came to utter ruin. They had lost control of themselves, and Satan made them do that which they detested. But even they have but a faint idea of spiritualism as it is. Ministers inspired of Satan can eloquently dress up this hideous monster, hide its deformity, and make it appear beautiful to many. But it comes so direct from his satanic majesty that he claims the right to control all who have to do with it, for they have ventured upon forbidden ground and have forfeited the protection of their Maker. Some poor souls who have been fascinated with the eloquent words of the teachers of spiritualism and have yielded to its influence afterward find out its deadly character and would renounce and flee from it, but cannot. Satan holds them by his power and is not willing to let them go free. He knows that they are surely his while he has them under his special control, but that if they once free themselves from his power, he can never bring them again to believe in spiritualism and to place themselves so directly under his control. The only way for such poor souls to overcome Satan is to discern between pure Bible truth and fables. As they acknowledge the claims of truth, they place themselves where they can be helped. They should entreat those who have had a religious experience and who have faith in the promises of God to plead with a mighty deliverer in their behalf. It will be a close conflict. Satan will reinforce his evil angels who have controlled these persons. But if the saints of God with deep humility fast and pray, their prayers will prevail. Jesus will commission holy angels to resist Satan, and he will be driven back and his power broken from off the afflicted ones. Mark 9.29 says, And he said unto them, This kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. The popular ministry cannot successfully resist spiritualism. They have nothing wherewith to shield their flocks from its baleful influence. Much of the sad result of spiritualism will rest upon ministers of this age, for they have trampled the truth under their feet and in its stead have preferred fables. The sermon which Satan preached to Eve upon the immortality of the soul, Ye shall not surely die, they have reiterated from the pulpit, and the people receive it as pure Bible truth. It is the foundation of spiritualism. The Word of God nowhere teaches that the soul of man is immortal. Immortality is an attribute of God only. 1 Timothy 6.16 6, says, Who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. God's word, rightly understood and applied, is a safeguard against spiritualism. And eternally burning hell preached from the pulpit and kept before the people does injustice to the benevolent character of God. It presents him as the veriest tyrant in the universe, this widespread dogma has turned thousands to universalism, infidelity, and atheism. 
the word of God is plain. It is a straight chain of truth and will prove an anchor to those who are willing to receive it, even if they have to sacrifice their cherished fables. It will save them from the terrible delusions of these perilous times. Satan has led the minds of the ministers of different churches to cling tenaciously to their popular errors, as he led the Jews in their blindness to cling to their sacrifices and crucify Christ. The rejection of light and truth leaves men captives, the subjects of Satan's deception. The greater the light they reject, the greater will be the power of deception and darkness which will come upon them. I was shown that God's true people are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. God requires of them continual advancement in the knowledge of the truth and in the way of holiness. Then will they understand the coming in of Satan, and in the strength of Jesus will resist him. Satan will call to his aid legions of his angels to oppose the advance of even one soul, and, if possible, wrest it from the hand of Christ. I saw evil angels contending for souls, and angels of God resisting them. The conflict was severe. Evil angels were corrupting the atmosphere with their poisonous influence and crowding about these souls to stupefy their sensibilities. Holy angels were anxiously watching and waiting to drive back Satan's host. But it is not the work of good angels to control the minds of men against their will. If they yield to the enemy and make no effort to resist him, then the angels of God can do but little more than hold in check the host of Satan that they shall not destroy until further light is given to those in peril to move them to arouse and look to heaven for help. Jesus will not commission holy angels to extricate those who make no effort to help themselves. If Satan sees that he is in danger of losing one soul, he will exert himself to the utmost to keep that one. And when the individual is aroused to his danger and with distress and fervor looks to Jesus for strength, Satan fears that he will lose a captive, and he calls a reinforcement of his angels to hedge in the poor soul and form a wall of darkness around him that heaven's light may not reach him. But if the one in danger perseveres and in his helplessness casts himself upon the merits of the blood of Christ, our Savior listens to the earnest prayer of faith and sends a reinforcement of those angels that excel in strength to deliver him. Satan cannot endure to have his powerful rival appeal to, for he fears and trembles before his strength and majesty. At the sound of fervent prayer, Satan's whole host trembles. He continues to call legions of evil angels to accomplish his object, and when angels, all-powerful, clothed with the armory of heaven, come to the help of the fainting, pursued soul, Satan and his host fall back, well knowing that their battle is lost. The willing subjects of Satan are faithful, active, and united in one object, and although they hate and war with one another, yet they improve every opportunity to advance their common interest. But the great commander in heaven and earth has limited Satan's power. My experience has been singular, and for years I have suffered peculiar trials of mind. The condition of God's people and my connection with the work of God have often brought upon me a weight of sadness and discouragement which cannot be expressed. For years I have looked to the grave as a sweet resting place. In my last vision, I inquired of my attending angel why I was left to suffer such perplexity of mind and was so often thrown upon Satan's battleground. I entreated that if I must be so closely connected with the cause of truth, I might be delivered from these severe trials. There is power and strength with the angels of God, and I pleaded that I might be shielded. Then our past life was presented before me, 
and I was shown that Satan had sought in various ways to destroy our usefulness, that many times he had laid his plans to remove us from the work of God. He had come in different ways and through different agencies to accomplish his purposes, but through the ministration of holy angels he had been defeated. I saw that in our journeying from place to place, he had frequently placed his evil angels in our path to cause accident which would destroy our lives. But holy angels were sent upon the ground to deliver. Several incidents and accidents have placed my husband and myself in great peril, and our preservation has been wonderful. I saw that we had been the special objects of Satan's attacks because of our interest in and connection with the work of God. As I saw the great care which God has every moment for those who love and fear Him, I was inspired with confidence and trust in God and felt reproved for my lack of faith. Chapter 6 The Two Crowns in the vision given me at Battle Creek, Michigan, October 25, 1861, I was shown this earth, dark and gloomy. Said the angel, Look carefully. Then I was shown the people upon the earth. Some were surrounded by angels of God, others were in total darkness, surrounded by evil angels. I saw an arm reached down from heaven holding a golden scepter. On the top of the scepter was a crown studded with diamonds. Every diamond emitted light, bright, clear, and beautiful. Inscribed upon the crown were these words, All who win me are happy and shall have everlasting life. Below this crown was another scepter, and upon this also was placed a crown, in the center of which were jewels, gold and silver, reflecting some light. The inscription upon the crown was, Earthly treasure, riches is power, all who win me have honor and fame. I saw a vast multitude rushing forward to obtain this crown. They were clamorous. Some in their eagerness seemed benefit of reason. They would thrust one another, crowding back those who were weaker than they and trampling upon those who in their haste fell. Many eagerly seized hold of the treasures within the crown and held them fast. The heads of some were as white as silver and their faces were furrowed with care and anxiety. Their own relatives, bone of their bone and flesh of their flesh, they regarded not. But as appealing looks were turned to them, they held their treasures more firmly, as though fearful that in an unguarded moment they should lose a little or be induced to divide with them. Their eager eyes would often fasten upon the earthly crown and count and recount its treasures, Images of want and wretchedness appeared in that multitude and looked wishfully at the treasures there and turned hopelessly away as the stronger overpowered and drove back the weaker. Yet they could not give it up thus, but with a multitude of deformed, sickly, and aged, they sought to press their way to the earthly crown. Some died in seeking to reach it, Others fell just in the act of taking hold of it. Many had but just laid hold of it when they fell. Dead bodies strewed the ground, yet on rushed the multitude, trampling over the fallen and dead bodies of their companions. Everyone who reached the crown possessed a share in it and was loudly applauded by an interested company standing around it. A large company of evil angels were very busy. Satan was in the midst of them, and all looked with the most exulting satisfaction upon the company struggling for the crown. He seemed to throw a peculiar charm upon those who eagerly sought it. Many who sought this earthly crown were professed Christians. Some of them seemed to have a little light. They would look wishfully upon the heavenly crown and would often seem charmed with its beauty, yet they had no true sense of its value and glory. 
while with one hand they were reaching forth languidly for the heavenly, with the other they reached eagerly for the earthly, determined to possess that, and in their earnest pursuit for the earthly they lost sight of the heavenly. They were left in darkness, yet were anxiously groping about to secure the earthly crown. Some became disgusted with the company who sought it so eagerly. They seemed to have a sense of their danger and turned from it and earnestly sought for the heavenly crown. The countenances of such soon changed from dark to light and from gloom to cheerfulness and holy joy.